going to be in 2 Corinthians today, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The title of the message today is Strapped, Generous Living. Generous Living. Now, last week we talked about we are tempted to serve money, we're tempted to love money, but in the grand scheme of things, only are we to serve and to love the Lord, right? Money serves us as we serve the Lord. That's the way it works out, right? Well, understand generosity is what we're going to talk about today. Generous living. And generosity is wonderful to see, right? I mean, don't you just love to see generosity, and especially when it's to you, right? I mean, you love people being generous with you. And we love that, but we need to see that there's the other side of that too. See, generosity is not just about giving. Okay, generosity uh, includes not only finances, generosity includes words. Generosity includes love. Generosity includes encouragement. Generosity includes all of these things that we as humans need to survive and to flourish. And we can be generous in all of those things. You see, Generosity flows from inside of us, okay? Generosity is not something that you only give when you have something to give. Generosity is an attitude of the heart, not the bottom line in your checkbook, okay? Generosity in itself has elements of gratefulness, joy, grace, humility, and all these things come from a heart that is captivated by the love of our Heavenly Father. You see, that's where generosity begins. It, it begins with Him, the Lord, being the most generous of all ever. Gave of Himself completely in generosity towards us. And when we start to understand that in our lives, then we start to let go of those things that we hold back, those, those things that we keep for ourselves. You see, God wants us to be generous and live this life with open hands, not with clenched fists, right? Let's go to the Word. We're going to be in chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read 15 verses, and then we're going to, we're going to understand what the Lord has for us here today. Now, concerning the ministry to the saints, it is unnecessary for me to write to you, for I know your eagerness, and I brag about you to the Macedonians. Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I sent the brothers so our boasting about you in the matter would not prove empty, and so that you'd be prepared, as I said. For, any, for if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, would be embarrassed in that situation. Therefore, I considered it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and to arrange in advance the generous gift that you promised, so that it will be ready as, the gift, as a gift and not as an extortion. Remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he scattered, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many acts of thanksgiving to God. They will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with others through the proof provided by this service. And they will have deep affection for you in their prayers on your behalf because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Paul's writing the Corinthians here. There is a great famine 
that is happening in Jerusalem at the time. In addition to that, the believers in Christ in Jerusalem, um, if, they have, if they were Jews, they were kicked out of their household. They were fired from their jobs. And so they were left homeless and, and penniless. And if you were a, uh, a, a Gentile that came to faith in Christ, you most likely lost your job there too because nobody at that time would let Christians work. They didn't want to associate with them because they didn't worship the gods of the day. And if you were Jewish and you changed from being a Jew to, to following Christ, they would actually give you a funeral because you were dead to them. And so there was a great upheaval in Jerusalem. I mean, people were, were starving. And so the churches that had been planted out from Jerusalem, uh, they had been encouraged to try to send back an offering to Jerusalem to help the brothers and sisters in Christ so that they could survive. And so the Corinthian church was a very wealthy church. And they had been telling everybody, we're going to give. We're going to give a big amount. We're going to give. Paul writes to them in 2 Corinthians to remind them of what they had said. Right? He's telling them, remember, you said this, and I bragged to everybody about you because you said this, and y'all can back it up. So I just want to prepare you, because I want when people come to you to take that offering to Jerusalem, that it's prepared as an offering and not as an extortion. And Paul reminds them, beginning in verse 6, he reminds them this great understanding of what generosity is. Now, I love these passages here because it's so practical. I mean, the Lord provides for us through his creation understanding of the way that he works in the world. You see, the first thing that we see is the method for this generosity. Verse 6, remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Now, this is a very simple principle. This is, some people have called this the law of the harvest. If you've ever planted anything in your life, you can understand this somewhat. You, uh, I come from a long line of, of family that were cotton farmers in West Texas, right? I, I, I couldn't be a cotton farmer myself because it takes more faith, I think, in many ways, to grow crops like that, to depend on the Lord for your rain and for the sunshine and for the good weather and all of that stuff. It's, it's a great act of faith to do that. But they would always, during planting season, they would always sow a whole bunch of cotton seed. We had these cotton planters. They would have row behind them, rows behind them. They had these big drums on them, and they would pour 100-pound bags of seed into every one of those drums. And they could do about an acre at that, at that level, and they would keep going. And, and they would plant and plant and plant, and then they would pray and pray and pray, and they would take care of the weeds, and they would do all that. And at the end of this, at the end of the time, you would see that there would be a great harvest. Literally, the fields were white unto harvest. You see, that's a, that's a principle that God has set forth, not only in agricultural, but it works in our lives too. Right? You can just basically sum this passage up in a few words. Plant little, harvest little. Plant abundantly, reap abundantly. Okay, it's, it's very simple how this works, right? We can understand it. If you're going to plant seeds and, and you're trying to plant a garden yourself, you know that not every seed is going to come up, but you know that you're going to plant as many seeds as you can to make sure that you have a good crop. And as we think about this, I think there's three truths about the reaping and the sowing that we need to understand, right? Uh, the first thing that we need to understand about this method is that you will always reap what you sow. Okay, you'll always reap what you sow. You can turn over to Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Galatians 6, beginning in verse 7. Paul's talking to the Galatian church, and he says, Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. From the Spirit. So we must not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, 
We must work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. See, Paul wrote that book, Galatians, also, and he knows about this. He sees it in his life. You see, when you, when you reap, you always get it. When you plant beans, what's going to come up when you plant beans? Beans. You plant corn, what's going to come up? Corn. You plant and you sow love, what are you going to get? If you plant and sow anger, what are you going to get? If you plant and sow complaints, you're going to reap misery. All right, so whatever we sow, that is what we're going to reap. People forget that. Right, what we sow, that's what we're going to reap. If you're chintzy with your money, if you're chintzy with encouragement and with love and with those things, guess what? You're not getting any of that stuff back. I've heard people say, well, I'm, I'm just not very generous because nobody's been very generous with me. And I, I, just, I just had to tell them it's because you're a miser. You see, God wants us to live in such a way, not just financially, but in such a way that we can just love people, that we can give of our time, we can give of our finances, we can give of our energy, we can give encouraging words and, and just love people like we should, and that will come back to us because we sow and we reap what we have sown. You see, God, that works in everything, in every area, every area of life. Another truth that we can learn from the reaping and sowing is that you always reap more than you sow. Now that's extraordinary, isn't it? You plant a, a corn seed. You get a stalk of corn with two, three, four heads. Four. That's amazing. Four ears of corn. Out of one seed. How does that work? Well, that's the way God works. I can't explain it to you. I can't explain how that one little seed turns into this stalk that turns into ears of corn. I don't know. Right? You plant a little acorn. And then before you know it, you've got this huge tree. Right? You are going to be able to reap more than you sow. So let me put that on another level. What if you sow kind words to people? What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be amazing what God can do through kind words. I've known people that have saved other people's lives because they've, they've sown kind words into their hearts. An instance where people were going to take their own life and somebody was kind to them, not knowing in the situation that they were in. They loved them and they were kind to them. And they didn't take their life. And, and they finally revealed it to the person months later. You know, I was going to commit suicide until you were kind to me. You showed love to me. So you never can tell when those words that you are sowing are going to save a life. They're going to encourage somebody beyond measure. See, not only those words, but what if, what if a dollar that we give to the work of the Lord affects so many thousands of people across the world? That's one thing I love about the Southern Baptist Convention, the, the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board. Because when we do the, the offerings, the, North Ameri the Lottie Moon and the Annie Armstrong and all that stuff, everything that we give goes directly to the field to share Christ with people. I mean, that's extraordinary. And it's amazing how the Lord does that because the Lord also, in the midst of this, right, we, we reap more than we sow. So when you give a dollar to the Lord, it's like he takes that and he multiplies it. And it says your dollar goes a lot further than you would ever think it will. And I think oftentimes we, we won't know about how, I, how we have affected the world until we get to heaven. Right, we're going to see people, I believe fully that we will meet people in heaven that are there because we, we gave to missions or we went on mission. I believe that we will we'll see and meet people that we have no idea who they are. But by us as a people being generous with everything that we have, the Lord has added to his kingdom and grown his kingdom through people that are generous with what God has given us.
You see, so we always reap more than we sow. The last one that I want us to understand from this method is that you always reap later than you sow. That's one thing that we don't like, right? I remember the first time we planted a garden. And I was out there, and, and the kids were out there, and, and they were small, and they were looking. And so we planted the seeds, and we watered it. And the next day, they get up, and they're looking out the window. Well, what are you looking for? Well, it, it's supposed to be growing, Dad. There should be a plant there. We grew, we planted seeds, and we watered it. It's supposed to grow. Well, it's not quite time yet. It's got to take some time before it actually happens. Most of us, we want to be generous, but we want to be generous and we want to see the effects of it right then. Right? We want to see the effects of what's happening right then. We, we are the microwave society, right? But it never takes overnight. We always have to have patience and see that the harvest is going to come. Right? I mean, we, you, you plant it and then you see the Lord grow it. Then you get to take the fruit from it. But it's always a process and it always takes time. You see, if you're giving uh, to, to get something back quickly, you're, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Right? We are to give and then let the Lord make the increase. That's the beauty of it is we don't, I just love how we just plant the seed and God does all the other stuff. I mean, how easy can that be? I mean, really, that seed doesn't have to sit there and think about it. Oh, I've got to grow today. Oh, they're expecting a lot from me. I mean, I've got to make fruit for them. The seed doesn't have any worries. It's put in the ground. It's watered. The sun heats it. I mean, you see the, you see the Lord have this great process put in place. And it's the same with us. Right? We don't have to worry and think about, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? What you do is you open yourself up to the Lord and let him lead you in being generous and wherever he wants you to be generous and however he wants you to be generous. This reaping and the sowing, is, it's, it's a beautiful cycle that the Lord does. And I'll guarantee you there's no farmer that, that considers his seed to be a loss. That farmer plants and he knows that not every seed's going to come up, but he doesn't grieve over the seeds that don't come up. He, he glories in the seeds that do come up. Right? He never goes through. If, you know, the, the farmer sometimes, if he is chintzy with his seed, he'll cheat himself of the harvest. And I think that's what many people do is that we cheat ourselves of the harvest. We, we want to be generous with people, but we only give one seed here, and we give one seed there, and we do one seed here. And then we wonder why there's not an abundant harvest. Well, it's because we're still being chintzy with what God's given us. right? And, and we're the ones that miss out. If we can get that through our thick skulls, I think we would be a lot better off because... It's not about us, it's about him. And see, when he uses us to do that, we get the joy out of the deal. We get to see people's lives changed, but he's the one that's still feeding us. He's the one that's still taking care of us. He's the one that's still providing everything that we can give and be generous. Right? We're the ones that miss out when we live with closed hands. Right? God wants us to live with open hands. He goes on, and we've gone past the method. Now we've got the motive. Verse 7. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Motive. What is the motive for all of this stuff? He tells us that, you know, we're going we're gonna to plant, and we're going we're gonna to reap, you know, and all this good stuff. We're going to get all this. But why do we do it? I mean, when we took the offering earlier... Why did you put something in there if you did? Why? Do you do it out of compulsion? Do you do it out of joy? Do you do it out of thankfulness that the Lord has provided for you in such a way that you just can't help but to give? You see, what's the motive? Because that's very important. He says you don't need to give reluctantly or out of necessity. You shouldn't give because, because the preacher said to give. Simple as that. 
You don't give because your wife or your husband gives you the elbow. You don't give just to get something back. Well, if I give, I might have a better week this week. You don't do that. God's not a vending machine. Okay, we give, as he says here, we should give as we decide in our heart. And God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful there, cheerful there in the Greek is hilario. We get the word hilariously from that. We should just give the Lord hilariously. Lord, here you go! Oh! You see, we shouldn't say, well, here you go, Lord. You see, you get nothing out of that. You get nothing out of that. The Lord has taught me over the years, and I'm, he's still working on me greatly. But I've learned it's, it is more blessed to give than to receive. To see people's hearts change and their eyes brightened when you get to be a vessel that the Lord uses for his glory, to help somebody. You see, he says here that we're not supposed to give reluctantly or out of necessity. He says that we don't need to do it in such a way that is about us. We need to do it in such a way that we understand it's about him. He says here, he says, do what you have decided in his heart. One thing I think we forget to do is that we forget to plan to be generous. Do you realize you can plan to be generous? I think most of us here just want to be generous just um, spontaneously. Spontaneous generosity. Now, there's, there is room for spontaneous generosity. But I think, too, that we need to plan to be generous. What if you set aside $20 a week to give to somebody that you don't know? That would be a plan. Right? You just say, okay, Lord, this week I'm giving $20. I've got a $20 bill in my pocket. And I'm going to give it to somebody who I don't know that you will lead me to. Man, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? I mean, just imagine what the Lord could do with that. And I'll guarantee you, you won't run out of $20 bills. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Because the Lord provides for those that he has a hold of their heart. You see, we're supposed to give freely, generously, deliberately. We've got to do it in such a way that, that, that we plan it. The farmer, when he goes out to plant... He has a plan for the planting. When you go out and plant your garden, you have a plan for your planting. I'm planting this here, and I'm planting this here, and I'm planting this here. right? And you have a plan for doing that. We need to be, as the people of God, we need to be planning our generosity with understanding that we will have times of spontaneous generosity. But we need to plan that. We, we don't give thoughtlessly, but we need to give cheerfully. In the Lord. I read the story of a church in India, northeastern India, in the, the Indian state of Mizoram. They are very um, oppressed in that part of India. Christians over there are second class citizens. They reveal, uh, I mean, they, they, they resemble a lot of the Christians in the time of Jerusalem during necessity for this, for this offering. And these Indian churches back in 1914, they began what they called the Bufai Tam as their way to express a giving to the Lord, right? And what this means in their language is one handful of rice at a time, right? One handful of rice at a time. And here's how it worked. The families in the church every week would take and set aside a handful of rice, from their portion, and they would set it aside for the Lord. And then at the end of the month, all the people of the church would bring the rice that they had collected, and they would collect it and put it at the church, and then the church would sell that rice and then give it to the people in need. In 1914, they raised in that first year a dollar fifty with all the rice and things that they had collected. As of last year in, in uh, 14, they had collected $1.5 million. These churches in northeastern India, with literally a handful of rice 
every day. Now with this 1.5 million, they support 1,800 missionaries in addition to the local church. People also have started giving in more creative ways. They're bringing vegetables, firewood, and any other resources that they can collect. The men, one of the leaders said, there's many ways to serve the Lord. Some people do great things. Some people are great preachers. Some people contribute lots and lots of money. But when we talk about this handful of rice, it is very humble. The service is done in the corner of the kitchen where nobody sees, but God knows and he blesses. Another church member said, it is not our richness and our poverty or our poverty that makes us serve the Lord, but our willingness. So we, me so people, say, as long as we have something to eat every day, we have something to give to God every day. Man, what a great idea. They set aside something every day so that they could be generous. Started out as a dollar fifty. And now these oppressed Indian people of the lower caste have put together a situation to where that over a million dollars is collected every year for people in need, for missionaries, for their ministries of the church. I want you to consider today what you would do with that handful of rice every day. If you're willing where you are, not where God can, not where everybody can see you, as they said here. It's, it's that silent kind of service that's done in the corner of your house, in the, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, in the, in the garage, where we set aside something for the Lord. And it is that kind of ministry that the Lord will bless. I challenge each of us, find our handful of rice. Find your handful of rice to give. Because the Lord will honor that. And the Lord has always been good. If you read the Bible, you know that the Lord's good at multiplying things. His math is always better than ours. So we go on. He goes not only about the method, not only, um, <clears throat> excuse me, about the motive, but he goes on and talks about the master. The master, verses 8 through 11. And God is able. Okay, I want you to say that. God is able. Okay, say it like you believe it. God is able. God is able. Okay, he brings them back here because they've been talking about them, right? You've been talking about the, the sowing and the reaping. He's been talking about you should give in a fashion to where you want to give and you give hilariously. But now he turns to the focus that we need to have. And he said, and God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. You see, when we think about it, uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, everything we have is from the Lord. Everything. Whatever you do in this life, or what, what, if you're retired, whatever you've ever done in your life to make money, God has given you that ability. He's given you the health to work at it. Okay, he's given you the job. He's given you the means to take care of all of that. He's the one, and it says, and God is able. They're reminding, he's reminding them that it is the Lord that is able to do this. You can't do it. If you plan to be generous, you're not going to be able to do it without the Lord's help. You've just got to give it to the Lord and let him take care of it. It says, in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. That's amazing. I mean, look at this. God is able to make every grace overflow to you. When he's talking about grace here, he's talking about the blessings of God. Having the blessing of the Lord on your house, on your family, upon you. He's talking about God has the ability to make this happen for you, to bless you and those around you, so that in every way, always having what you need. You notice there he doesn't say always having what you need want. You see, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of preachers in a whole bunch of churches today that are saying that this passage tells you that God wants you to be rich. That you give, if you keep giving, then you're going to get your Porsche, your Mercedes, you're going to get your big house, you're going to get this and that. But the only one getting rich in that deal is that preacher. I'm, I'm sorry, but it sickens me to know that there are preachers out there that live in 20,000 square foot homes. 
It sickens me to know that there are preachers that have Lear jets. Because they have snookered the people into giving all that they have, not for the work of the Lord, but for their pocketbook. You see, that's not what this passage is saying. It says that God will provide all that you need. I think more of us live way past our needs. You know, we go to Haiti, we go to Cuba, and we understand what it means to live and to have your needs met. Most of these people we go, they have two pairs of pants, they have a couple of shirts, they have one pair of, shoe, one pair of shoes, and they recycle those every day. Oh my gosh, can you believe that? You see, he says, we will, he will provide everything you need so that you may excel in every good work. What's he saying here? He said, if I can find your heart that is generous, I will keep feeding you. I'll be taking care of you. I'm going to meet every need that you have, but everything else that comes out flows through you to help those people around you. That's the way the Lord wants us to do it. We are vessels to do that, right? We are the conduit. We are the pipe that the living water flows through. Sometimes we, we, we clog it up, but God wants us to be an empty pipe. It says, He scattered. He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He's the one that does it. Now, verse 10, Now the one who provides seed, the one meaning God, He provides seed for the sower and bread for food. He will provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He'll provide for your bread. He will give you the seed to sow. And not only that, but there will be a spiritual element of it. Increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, let me tell you a secret. You can't take any of this stuff with you. All the things that we have, all, the pain, all this stuff, it's not going with us. And so when you look at this, he takes this turn here right at the end of verse 10 that increases the harvest of our righteousness. See, this affects us in our hearts. It affects the way, we, the way we see life, the way that we deal with people. Right? God wants us not to be wealthy in all this, but to help other people. And the focus is the harvest of the righteousness. That's the beauty of this whole thing is that God is doing a work through us, but he's doing more so a work in us. I love that the Lord, he doesn't care about all that stuff. He cares about us individually. He wants us to look more like Jesus every day. And he does that as we follow him and he pours out the harvest of his righteousness. You're going to be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. He's saying that this is a Amazing truth. God will provide for us when we are generous using things that he's given us. I think sometimes we think, oh man, my finances stink, my finances do that, and, and what we want to do is we want to hoard it. But what God says, well, why don't you plant some seed? Maybe you don't have enough money to, to, to help somebody buy Christmas. Well, why don't you help them buy something? Right? Why don't you provide a meal for them? Why don't you go buy a gift card and provide some food for them? Why bake, bake something for them. You see, there's always ways that God wants us to give and be his conduit. Right? He wants us to do great things for him. So he says that we will be provided for in everything here. Now he goes on and he finishes up with something bigger, the big picture, the results of all of this generosity. Right? He says in verse 12, for the ministry of this service. Now, you notice that word ministry, the ministry of this service. All the stuff that we do, all the generosity that we have, we may think it's just, be give, you know, that it's just giving and taking care of people, but in the understanding of, of the spiritual things, that's ministry. Okay, that is ministry taking care of people as we're called to take care of people. That is ministry. And he's saying the ministry of this is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is as as over, also overflowing in many acts of thanksgiving to God. Not only will you be providing food and, or money to these people in Jerusalem, but their hearts are going to overflow with thanksgiving. I mean, what, what could be greater than that? 
You're providing for them, and not only will they have something to eat, but they'll have this joy in their heart that somebody that's never met them, halfway across their area there, has provided for them food in a way that they didn't know was going to come. Man, that's great ministry. They will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel and for your generosity in sharing with them. Your gift to them is not only going to give them thankfulness in their heart, but they're going to glorify God for providing. You see, you don't get the credit for that. Let me tell you that just right now. Okay, if you're going to be generous, you don't take the credit. God takes the credit. You're just the basket that the bread is handed out in. The basket doesn't get a whole lot of glory. It's the bread provided by the baker that should get all the glory. He says, not only that, they will glorify God for the confession of the gospel of Christ. Your generosity and sharing, and then others through the proof provided by this service. They will have deep affection for you in their prayers and on behalf of the surpassing grace of God in you. See, the good thing about generosity is that it always flows downhill. It flows downhill. You see, it starts with you and you get your generous to somebody and then it just flows downhill. They are praising the Lord. They're giving glory to God and then it spreads out. Their family hears about it. What? Those people at the church, that person that you've known at work, they gave you, they, they fed you? Holy cow, that's great. You see, as Christians, we need to be known for great things because Jesus did a lot of great things. How would it be if we were all so generous that people said, those people at a ranch, oh, holy cow, they'd give you the shirt off their back if, they need, if you needed it. I mean, what a great church that is. They love their neighbors. They, they're generous beyond imagination. And those people, I mean, I worked with a person that I, I didn't know anything, but then they started taking care of me in some ways, and they were generous to me, and they were nice to me. And I said, why are you doing that? And they said, well, because I love God. And they're like, I don't know God. And there will always be opportunities in our generosity to share the love of God with those people around us. You see, that's where it begins right there is the love of God. This results, this ministry of generosity comes from the fact, as he says here, the confession, the obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ. You see, the gospel should change us. The gospel is not just for salvation. The gospel being Jesus Christ, the very son of the living God, stepped out of heaven, was born a child, took on flesh. He was still fully God and fully man. He grew perfectly without sin. He was the sacrifice on the cross for our sins. The Lord placed all the sins upon the world upon him. He suffered egregiously for us. He took our sin where we should be the ones on the cross. And he died for our sin, the perfect sacrifice. And then they laid him in a borrowed tomb. He couldn't even afford a place to bury him. And on the third day, he was resurrected to life. Still alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us even now. Now. That understanding, the good news, the gospel, that should challenge us as we've put our faith in Christ, but it should also challenge us to understand we should be the most thankful, grateful people on the face of the earth. Because I did not earn my salvation. I'm a sorry dog at heart. Jeremiah says all of our hearts are wicked beyond measure. If I am left to my own devices, I always pick the wrong way. If I'm not walking with the Lord, I want to satisfy me and not him. I need the gospel every day. See, it is through this obedience to the gospel that we become generous in Christ. Are you generous? I mean, you really shouldn't ask yourself. You should probably ask those people that know you. Because in our own eyes, we're generous. But to everybody else around us, they might be thinking, man, that person could make, make a copper wire out of a penny. But really, are you generous? 
Are you generous with your finances, with, with the Lord, what the Lord has given you? Are you generous with your words? Are you generous with your encouragement? Or are you generous with criticism? You see, we're supposed to be generous with the good things. We shouldn't be generous with our criticism. We shouldn't be generous with our bad attitudes. We shouldn't be generous with a complaining heart, always thinking we don't have enough when somebody else has more. We should not be generous with those kinds of things. We should be generous with the good things. That's something you need to think about very seriously. Because that will change your life. Understanding that when we are generous, God provides for our generosity. And he will do an amazing thing through you. Now today I know that somebody here is not saved. Just chances are, with what we understand with, with percentages and all, there's somebody here that's not saved. There's somebody here that is not a believer in Christ. And that's probably the reason that you're not generous in the first place. Because you don't know the generosity of a saving God who gave of himself generously. Jesus laid down his own life. It was not taken from him. Today, if you've not put your faith in Christ, if you've never repented of your sins and say, God, forgive me for my sin against you. Thank you, Lord, for taking my sin upon you. Lord, take my life. If you've never done that in your life, then today's the day to do that. Jesus said he is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. That is the truth of the word of God. All roads do not lead up the mountain to one God. It is only Jesus Christ himself and his sacrifice upon the cross. If you've not put your faith in Christ today, during this invitation, we'll invite you to come and we will lead you to him. As brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to answer the question now, are you generous? Are you living a life of generosity or are you living a life of closed hands? I can't answer that for you. Only you and those around you can answer that. Just as we saw with the reaping and the sowing, you are doing more harm to yourself if you do it with closed hands because you're not producing anything. You're not sowing anything for the Lord, for his kingdom. And so you're getting, you're reaping what you are sowing. As your pastor, as one who wants to lead you, I want you to understand that. The reason you may not have enough is because you haven't turned it over to the Lord. The reason your finances may stink Maybe because you haven't turned it over to the Lord. Maybe the reason that there is more month at the end of the money is because you are living with closed hands. Be a good farmer. Sow all that you can sow and see what the Lord can do.